Thank you, David. It's uh, an honor to be uh, part of this uh, program this morning with you. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk to you. We have a lot going on in the Harvard Department of Ophthalmology, uh, and I think as you know, my focus and those of many of us are in macular degeneration and uh, have been really thrilled to be part of the advances in the neovascular or wet form of macular degeneration. And those are being recognized uh, this year with the Champalimo Award for the work in bringing VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors uh, to patients. And now we're able to uh, see that a million people worldwide receive those injections uh, for macular degeneration, but also for diabetic macular edema and renal vein occlusion. But clearly there's lots more to be done. <laughs> And uh, we are pursuing uh, several different areas, uh, as are others around, uh, around the country and really around the world. So I think in trying to understand where to treat or where to go after earlier forms of macular degeneration, we really need to understand the pathophysiology better. And in looking at the information that's come out earlier on, obviously, from epidemiology and clinical observation, now added to, particularly with uh, genetics and molecular biology, you can end up putting the pathways into several categories, and I really have uh, narrowed that down to six pathways. The first is age, <laughs> and I think age is kind of a hard nut to crack. Uh, we, I don't claim that we at Harvard are, are, after, are able to do that one yet. But then the other uh, big one is lipid and lipid metabolism and transport, and I really think that's an exciting opportunity and we can come back to that. Uh, inflammation, and by this really sort of smoldering, chronic, uh, inflammatory processes, then including things like the complement pathway is another important avenue. Then cell adhesion and the extracellular matrix is another uh, target that people are looking at, probably a little bit less at the moment. Uh, angiogenesis, you know, we sort of talked about and covered. And then things related to cellular stress and toxicity and really cell death. And so this gets us into things like neuroprotection, which uh, we are pretty keen on in the Harvard Department and think there's a lot of opportunity there. So tell us about uh, some of the work that will be presented by your cohort here at Harvard. <laughs> Sure, the, Preview the forthcoming <laughs> attractions, so to speak. Well, thanks. There, there's quite a lot, and I, I won't uh, even attempt to cover a, uh, much of that, but I think uh, we touched on lipids and lipid transport, and there's some exciting work uh, being led by one of our investigators, uh, Dr. Demetrius Vavas, uh, at Harvard, looking at ways to basically suck out or really remove the lipids that accumulate uh, in the outer retina. Uh, to see if you can uh, give something systemically that will really help with that. And that's really based on work by Christine Curcio and others who've demonstrated this accumulations of lipids in the lipid, lipid wall and then uh, deposits and ultimately drusen in, in dry macular degeneration. And we think that's, that's targetable. You know, she talks about getting rid of the oil spill and we really think that's, that's got promise. To what extent does existing armamentarium of hypocholesterolemic agents have an impact? Have the studies shown that this does have an impact in terms of decreasing the incidence, decreasing the severity of dry macular degeneration? Well, the statins are an interesting story, and I'm going to cover a little bit of this in the Weisenfeld lecture on Monday. And uh, people were obviously interested in those early on to see whether statin use could decrease either the incidence of macular degeneration or its progression. And overall, the studies were really mixed. In fact, there was a big Cochrane analysis that showed that really there seemed to be no benefit. Uh, Robin Geimer has had a more recent study looking to see if uh, statin, and this particular statin, could have an effect and seemed to get a little suggestion of something there. And what Dr. Vavas has done is to look at the cardiovascular literature, and their high dose statins can actually uh, prevent restenosis of vessels and even lead to a resolution of the plaque. So he's approaching that using high dose statins in patients, you know, select patients with macular degeneration that really have quite a bit in the way of deposits uh, accumulating and has some preliminary data that looks really exciting. One of the issues has always been bioavailability. Do you get enough statins to the right place? And the blood-brain barrier is a very complex barrier. Uh, do we, are we actually know that we're getting statins at an effective level at the sites at which they need to act? 
Well, sure, that's a good question, and I think he, he, Vavas has probably addressed that empirically. Here, we're not trying to get really across the blood-brain barrier so much as, you know, you're, it's really at the level of the choriocapillaris, Brooks membrane, uh, sub-RPE, and uh, at least the evidence to date suggests that you're able to, to address that. Because one of the challenges now with statins, as you're probably aware, is an increased incidence of diabetes, uh, the memory effects, and of course the, the problem with high dose statins, and that is chronic myalgia, and muscle pain. So it's, a, it's, it's a sort of a mixed blessing in terms of the side effects. Yeah, though it's interesting, the, the myalgia, the, the muscle problems that are really probably the most problematic are not dose dependent, they're idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. So if you, you're either going to get them or not, if you get them, obviously that's not a good thing. And really, the issues in following patients with a high dose statins is more following their liver function tests and actually thyroid function. Uh, but so far, and again, it's very preliminary data, but it looks, looks pretty safe. Certainly many, many people are on statins currently, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing how, how much that has penetrated. Uh, but this is you know, only one approach. I don't think it's, it's going to be the be-all and end-all, but it's an interesting observation and has some promise with, with drugs that are, you know, off patent and out there and available. So switching gears to the inflammasome, obviously this is a, a, an area of hot interest right now. There was some discussion presented uh, at the Harvard AMD conference uh, in October with regard to antiretrovirals and their value uh, as influencing, positively influencing impact. How far has that work progressed? Uh, I think that's still going on. I think the inflammasome is an interesting target, uh, you know, and there's, there's sort of two camps on that. You know, it's either good or it's bad, <laughs> and hopefully we'll be able to figure that out over uh, ensuing months and years. But uh, the inflammasome, interestingly, looks like it, you know, may be responding to these depositions of lipids primarily, you know, the, the uh, nucleic acids and things is another approach, but they're certainly the complicated and altered lipoproteins may be a target for the inflammasome and maybe why it becomes involved, similar to what it does in gout with, with crystals, you know, it's sort of responding to these complex uh, molecules and, uh, and leading to inflammation. What are some of the lead antibodies that you're concerned about in macular degeneration? I have not done a lot of work in pursuing antibodies, and, uh, so I really don't know that I would rattle those off. I mean, there have been, there's been work in, in infection way back when. We did some also, and that's potentially another uh, source of this inflammatory, you know, inflammatory genesis, <laughs> making up words in science, uh, you know, the sort of genesis of inflammation in this disease process. So, uh, talking, you spoke about the strawberry programs that uh, have been piloted by you and your colleagues at Harvard. What are some of the most interesting projects that uh, you've seen at Arvo 2015? Well, there's, there's a lot of good things going on, and I'm uh, looking forward to, to all of that. I think other areas that uh, are fascinating are the stem cell work, uh, some of that coming out of Japan uh, in particular, uh, but also regeneration and, and approaches there. Gene therapy remains interesting for all kinds of diseases and whether the gene therapy might be used for a, a more broad-based approach to retinal disease for things like neuroprotection and others is also exciting. One of the members of your department was part of the stem cell trial that presented its uh, phase one results at uh, your conference. Yeah. Uh, how far are we towards phase two? Yeah, that was Dean Elliott who was yeah, presenting yeah. The, the early stem cell work and I think that was exciting at least from a safety standpoint. Um, and it really looks with that stem cell approach that we're trying to get trophic factors to the retina. So it's not about rebuilding or regenerating a whole retina. Uh, but I think that's, that's going along nicely. I haven't heard uh, information about when the phase two is, is uh, coming, but maybe, maybe we'll get to hear that over the next few days. Excellent. Professor Mona, thank you ever so much for granting this interview and sharing with us your unique perspectives. Great. Thanks very much. Do you want to add anything else? Yeah. I mean, unless you want a little bit of neuroprotection, we kind of yeah, missed that one, right. although it's going to be Vavis again, yeah. but <laughs> not trying to just give a plug, it's just the things that I know. <laughs> yeah, sure, so I, I think neuroprotection is an area that uh, we've been skittish of because it looked like it has failed in so many different situations, and certainly in the CNS, it's not had a great track record. But I think as in many cases in the CNS, the retina and the eye end up being really the optimal location to work out these initiatives. 
And again, Dr. Vavas in our department has an interesting program uh, along with Kip Connor and others looking at uh, cell death, photoreceptor cell death in particular, in different models of retinal disease, ranging from retinal detachment to models of macular degeneration and, and also inherited retinal degenerations. And has found that although apoptosis, which is the cell death pathway we know best, is certainly active there, turns out that program necrosis or necroptosis plays a major role. And if you inhibit apoptosis only, you end up driving the photoreceptors into another cell death pathway, the necroptosis, and you're not able to prevent cell death. So he's demonstrated in a nice series of experiments that with this combination approach, you can really protect the cells. And it seems to work across all of these um, models that he's pursued. So we're really keen and would love to get this into clinical trials. We're just trying to uh, move, that, move that to the next step. That sounds enormously promising. What specifically are they inhibiting? Telomerase? No, it's nec necrostatins actually that inhibit uh, these RIP kinases that are part of the, the control mechanisms for, nec for program necrosis. And uh, they're pretty simple little molecules and uh, easily delivered. It's a little more complicated to obviously target two different pathways. Uh, but I think that's, that's something that one could approach and it could have application to a whole slew of, of retinal diseases, certainly macular degeneration, but also the inherited retinal degenerations and even you know, cell death in situations like diabetes and vein occlusion and others. So a really broad-based approach. Uh, that is extraordinarily <laughs> promising news. Uh, perhaps the last question is for patients. You, you've given us this wonderful panorama of work that's going on. What, are, what elements of this work is closest to the clinic? Well, that's a great question, and I think uh, our patients are always asking, particularly those with early macular degeneration, you know, what about me? <laughs> you guys have done all this work on what's really the end stage of the disease, and now, you know, we need something earlier. So I think the approach with uh, lipids and the complement pathway is probably what's closest to giving us an answer uh, for patients, and that would be really exciting. I think our patients want to be able to do more than take vitamin supplementation and do a heart-healthy diet, although those things are clearly important as well. Excellent. Thank you again, Professor. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you.